This is chapter one from The Philosophy of Praxis, Marx, Lucas, and the Frankfurt School by Andrew Feinberg. The Philosophy of Praxis, Marx and Lucas. In this chapter, I discuss the philosophy of the early Marx from a Lucasian perspective as background to the exposition of Lucas's own parallel attempt to resolve the problems first posed by Marx. Considerable differences separate these thinkers, and there is always the risk that in comparing them in this manner, the identity of one will be submerged in that of the other. I will do my best to avoid an artificial identification of the two positions where they do actually differ. However, I will argue that in spite of real differences, we are dealing here with a specific philosophical doctrine, which I will call philo philosophy of praxis and which is shared by a number of thinkers. While writing his notebook, while writing his notebooks in prison, Gramsci used the phrase philosophy of praxis ambiguously to signify Marxism in general and his own cultural interpretation of Marxism. In essence, Gramsci argues that all knowledge is situated in a cultural context, itself based on a class-specific worldview. No domain of knowledge and no corresponding domain of being is independent of society. That interpretation, which he called absolute historicism, resembles in broad outline the Hegelian Marxism of Lucas, Korch, Bloch, Marcuse, and the early work of Marx himself. It seems appropriate, therefore, to call this whole trend philosophy of praxis, not as a euphemism for Marxism in general, but rather to distinguish a particular radical philosoph philosophical version of Marxism from other interpretations. The early method of Marx and Lucas is very different from the scientific socialism erected later on the basis of historical observation and economic theory. In 1843 and 1844, Marx developed a philosophy of revolution that he seems to have intended as a foundation for economic studies. From 1918 to 1923, Lucas elaborated a philosophy of revolution supplementing Marxist economics. For both the early Marx and Lucas, such central Marxist concepts as the proletariat and socialism were not first developed through empirical research. Instead, as philosophers, they set out from a critical discussion of the philosophical tradition in the course of which they deduced the characteristic historical concepts of Marxism. Included in this deduction is the concept of revolution, which plays a pivotal methodological role in their philosophies. In interpreting Marx's economic and philosophical manuscripts as a philosophy of praxis, I have been obliged to choose positions in some of the numerous debates over this early work. It will be useful at the outset to make these positions explicit by situating this interpretation with respect to some others. I will not review the enormous literature on the manuscripts. Only two facets of it are relevant here. The debates over the ontological and the normative character of social categories in the manuscripts. At issue is more than a matter of textual ex exegesis. <laughs> the larger question concerns whether the manuscripts are a philosophy of praxis, as I am engaged in defining it, or on the contrary, a far less ambitious ethical complement to economic research within the framework of some traditional ontology. I show the former that Marx founds a new concept of reason and revolution through an ontological treatment of social categories. This approach brings to the fore all that links the project of the early Marx to that of Lucas. But Marx's manuscripts had not yet been published when Lucas wrote History in Class Consciousness. In fact, capital is the primary basis of Lucas's Marxism rather than Marx's early work. Capital is self-consciously unphilosophical in spite of Marx's prefactory acknowledgement of Hegel's influence. In it, Marx is careful to minimize the use of philosophical terminology and to avoid the exploration of philosophical problems. Yet we now know on the basis of extensive textual evidence just how complex were the philosophical considerations behind capital. The link between the manuscripts and the published writings of Marx's maturity is supplied by his own draft of capital, the Grand Reis. But the publication of this text 
was delayed until the beginning of World War II. These textual absences combine with the image of Marx wish to project of his work in Capital seem to authorize a scientific interpretation of his later doctrine that Lucas first challenged from a dialectical perspective. Lucas made the connection between Marxism and philosophy, that is, between Marx and Hegel, primarily through reflection on Marx's methodology in his economic writings, and only secondarily on the basis of those of Marx's comments on philosophical matters with which he was acquainted. This is possible because, as Ernest Mandel remarks, the concept of alienation is part of the mature Marx's instrumentarium. Lucas was in fact the first to show this, to notice and explain not merely the influence of Hegel on Marx's early political essays or on the general Marxian worldview, but on the concepts and method of capital. He reevaluated Marx's famous coquetting with Hegel and concluded that in that work, a whole series of categories of central importance and in constant use stem directly from Hegel's logic. Lucas reconstructed a philosophy of praxis from the methodological traces of Marx's philosophical position visible in his economic writings. The result of this effort is not identical with the position of either the manuscripts or the Grand Reis. Nevertheless, it is impressive to what extent Lucas's somewhat speculative exploration or ex extrapolations from Marx's published work can find support in these unpublished ones. Most important, Lucas's philosophy of praxis has remarkable structural similarities to that of Marx, notably insofar as Lucas develops an original critique of philosophy paralleling Marx's own. This convergence has a biographical background. Like Marx, Lucas was deeply schooled in Hegelian dialectics, and so when he sought to develop Marx's philosophy, he returned to the Hegelian doctrine from which Marx set out. It is this link, mediated by the supposedly scientific work, Capital, which bespeaks an affinity of Marxism for philosophy of praxis. Yet this biographical coincidence does not quite explain the similarity of the transformation undergone by Hegel's dialectical, dialectic at their hands. The Antinomies The defining trait of philosophy of praxis is the claim that the antinomies of philosophy can only be resolved in history. The concept of antinomy employed here is derived from Hegel, for whom it signifies the ever-widening gap between subject and object in modern culture. Ever since Descartes distinguished the two substances, philosophy and life have become more and more sharply sundered. Rich and complex theories of the subjective dimension of being explain, of, of being explain the meaning of freedom, value, political ideals, while equally powerful and encompassing theories of the objective dimension of being explain the laws of necessity in nature and history. From his earliest to his last works, Hegel saw his task as cataloging the resulting contradictions in modern culture and transcending them in a dialectical conception of being that would take into account both its subjective and objective dimensions. For Hegel, the resolution of the antinomies is a theoretical task. However, he believes that this task can only be carried out under specific historical conditions that happen to be those of his own time and place. Philosophy of praxis begins with a critique of the conservative implications of this resolution of the antinomies and a radicalization of its historical aspect. Both Marx and Lucas argued that because Hegel could not conceive of really radical changes in modern culture, he treated temporary historical conditions such as monarchy and wage labor as though they were eternal necessities. They claimed that the antinomies would be transcended by social revolution and not by philosophical speculation. Had Marx confined himself to arguing this position in relation to the antinomies of moral and political life, he would have created a new political philosophy. This new philosophy would have been compatible with a traditional ontology and might have been formulated as a left variant of Hegel's philosophy. Marx's startling innovation was to include all the antinomies in his theory of revolution, 
those relating to epistemology and ontology, as well as the moral and political ones. He thus arrived at the astounding proposition that social change could not only accomplish such goals as reconciling indiv individual and society, moral responsibility and self-interest, but that it could also unite subject and object, thought and being, man and nature. This proposition has a number of paradoxical corollaries from which we must not shrink in interpreting the early Marx. As we will see in later chapters, Lucas and Marcuse pose a related challenge. When philosophy of praxis contends that human action is philosophically relevant, not just in ethics or politics, but in all domains, it is asserting a wholly original ontological position. For this philosophy, human action touches being as such, and not simply those special domains we usually conceive as affected by our activities. In somewhat different terms, essentially this same requirement can be formulated as the transcendence of the antinomy of value and fact, ought and is. For if human action affects being, then values do not confront a normless and humanly indifferent reality but rather represent its highest potentialities. This position is coherent only where being is interpreted through a special sphere in which human being is actually able to transform the objects on which it acts. Then the apparently humanly indifferent spheres, such as nature, can be ontologically subordinated to a sphere within which action affects the substratum of reality, for example, history. Action can only constitute reality where reality cannot be conceived independent of that special sphere. The attempt to understand being in general through human being is a kind of inverted philosophical anthropology. Marx, Lucas, and the Frankfurt School share this approach with philosophers such as Feuerbach and Heidegger. With this difference, the latter focus on the individual and so construct speculative philosophies with moralistic overtones. For philosophers of praxis, on the contrary, history is the parad paradigmatic order for the interpretation of being generally. For this philosophy, reality is historical. In history itself is to be understood as in essence an object of human practice. Because the philosophy of praxis conceives being as history and history is the product of human action, it can, it can mutatis mutandis conceive of human action as relevant to the constitution of being. Action takes on a universal significance, going beyond the social world to affect being as such. As Lucas puts it, we have made our own history and if we are able to regard the whole of reality as history, i.e. as our history, for there is no other, we shall have raised ourselves in fact to the position from which reality can be understood as our action. The ontologically significant relation between human being and being in general is now social action because history is constituted in such action. History is ontology and the becoming of the human species is the privileged domain within which the antinomies of philosophy can finally be resolved. In an early essay on Marx's manuscripts, Marcuse concludes that the history of man is at the same time the happening of the whole of nature. His history is the production and reproduction of the whole of nature, the furtherance of objective being through the renewed sublation of its current form. Throughout this book, I will be concerned with the implications of this remarkable proposition. These implications can be considered under two main headings. First, there is the dimension of philosophy of praxis concerned with the resolution of social antinomies through the, through the disalienation or dereification of social life. As I have argued above, the ambition of philosophy of praxis goes beyond social theory, for it claims that all objectivity can be disalienated, starting out from the disalienation of society. This wider claim indicates a second dimension of the theory concerned with the ontological generalization of the social analysis. This most daring dimension of the philosophy of praxis will be treated through what I call a metacritical approach to the history of philosophy.
Later chapters will then consider the problematic role of nature and attempt to formulate an original response to the difficulties it poses for an absolute historicism. This argument will draw on the resources of philosophy of praxis and what I take to be its final formulation in the late work of Herbert Marcuse. Before turning to a discussion of the concept of metacritique and its relevance to the idea of a realization or end of philosophy, I would like, I would like to consider briefly some of the objections to viewing Marx's philosophy of praxis as a contribution to ontology ontology or history. With the possible exception of Marcuse, the Frankfurt School contests the interpretation of Marx's manuscripts as a philosophy of praxis. Alfred Schmidt's careful study of Marx's concept of nature attempts to situate the manuscripts at an equal distance from a materialist ontology and an absolute historicism. Jürgen Habermas also rejects the interpretation of Marx's manuscripts as a philosophy of praxis. He argues that the early Marx distinguishes between nature as such and nature as it enters the historical sphere through labor, and which therefore has a social character. Marx's social theory would have implications only for society in the larger framework of a naturalistic ontology. Within this same tradition, however, it is customary to attack Lucas's philosophy of praxis as idealistic. Thus, the similarities I identify between the early Marx and Lucas are denied. It is interesting to note that another influential school of Marxist thought founded by Louis Althusser makes no such distinction. Rejecting equally the early Marx and Lucas, the Althusserians see in both a romantic refusal of scientific objectivity and the independence of nature. There is thus a certain unwitting convergence of Frankfurt School and Althusserian interpretations in that both emphasize the autonomy of nature by contrast with philosophy of praxis and condemn as idealistic any doctrine that attempts to understand nature through history. I cannot consider these convergent critiques in detail. Here, I would like to simply sketch the Frankfurt School's attempt to save the early Marx from historicism. In Knowledge and Human Interests, Habermas admits that Marx's text is ambiguous. He claims that the ambiguities have given rise to a phenomenological strain of Marxism that overlooks Marx's naturalism and for which the category of labor then acquires unawares the meaning of world constituting life activity in general. Although Habermas includes Marcuse in this phenomenological strain, this would only be true of the very early and late work. Throughout much of his career, Marcuse's position was close to Schmitt's and Habermas's in denying the ontological status of social categories. In Reason and Revolution, for example, Marcuse too notes the ambiguities of Marx's text. He writes, All this has an obvious resemblance to Hegel's idea of reason. Marx even goes so far as to describe the self-realization of man in terms of the unity of thought and being. But, in fact, Marx detached dialectical or dialectic from this ontological base. In his work, the negativity of reality become becomes a historical condition which cannot be hypostasized as a metaphysical state of affairs. Such an interpretation may explain Marx's later Marxism, but it does not account for the manuscripts. It is particularly significant that in the formulations of Habermas and Marcuse, the antinomies Marx attempted to transcend reappear as alternatives between which he is supposed to have chosen, naturalism or humanism, history or ontology, but Marx himself writes, communism as a fully developed naturalism is humanism, and as a fully developed humanism is naturalism. It is the definitive resolution of the antagonism between man and nature and between man and man. It is the true solution of the conflict between existence and essence, between objectification and self-affirmation, between freedom and necessity between individual and species. It is the solution of the riddle of history and knows itself to be this solution.
The early Marx would not have defined his own advance over Hegel as the demonstration that alienation is a historical category, rather an ontological one. He argued that all ontology is historical in essence, and that the dichotomy between being and history is therefore false. This is the main claim of philosophy of praxis, the idea that history, properly understood, has ontological significance. As a philosopher of praxis, Marx did not choose between an ontological and a historical interpretation of the social categories. He chose both. Hence, his most striking utterances, such as the one just quoted, or the following. Society is the accomplished union of man and nature, the veritable resurrection of nature, the realized naturalism of man and the realized humanism of nature. The normative dimension. The interpretation of the manuscripts as a philosophy of praxis is also challenged from an ethical point of view. Marx's claim that the human essence is alienated is frequently said to imply an ethical ideal. Marx is supposed to have rested his case for revolution on the injustice of capitalist alienation. Humanity's true essence as species being imperatively requires the overthrow of capitalism and the creation of conditions in which social institutions are based on cooperation and creativity rather than competition. This formulation recapitulates the antinomy of value and fact, i.e. capitalist fact versus socialist value. Not everyone agrees. Some see in the manuscripts an attempt to transcend the opposition of value and fact presupposed by this interpretation. The debate over the manuscripts is of course related to the larger debate over Marxism and ethics. Considered as a philosophy, of praxis. Marx's theory is unquestionably normative in some sense, but I argue that it is not based on an ethical conception. What is at stake here is the dialectical character of Marx's theory, hence also his relation to Hegel. Were Marx to accept the dichotomy of value and fact, ethics and social reality, he would regress behind Hegel to a utopian moralistic position like that of Bruno Bauer and Moses Hess. In his essay on Hess, Lucas showed that these left Hegelians attempted to recover revolutionary possibilities by positing ethical values as the basis for knowledge of the future. They thus rejected Hegel's concrete analysis of and reconciliation with the present. In his mature works, Hegel found the ought realized in the is of his society. On Hegel's terms, if Marx had posited the human essence as an ethical ideal, philosophy would already have transcended it, theoretically, through the demonstration of the relative rationality of what is. Alienation might, like the police courts Hegel deduces from the idea, remain as an unpleasant fact of practical life. But then so are fleas and measles. The indifference of philosophical happiness, or sorry, the indifference of philo philosophical reason to such matters, essentially to human happiness, is not arbitrary but expresses the essence of social reality. The demand for the abstract ideal is a moment of negation, necessarily frustrated by an objectivity that transcends it, that is to say, by reason itself. Hegelianism is not overcome by the renewed positing of the ideal but rather anticipates it and refutes it in advance. Hegel's critique of Kant and of abstract ethical idealism influenced Marx to seek a basis for revolutionary theory in the tendencies of social reality and a dialectic of, of ideal and real in history. Lucas argues that Hegel prepared the Marxian approach. He says, in contrast to Fichte with his revolutionary utopia, Hegel developed very early on his work, the tendency to understand what is, a tendency which originally pointed energetically in the direction of the future. His concept to comprehend the present as at once become, as at once become and becoming is the germ of a true historical dialectics, the dialectics of history translated into thought. For it is precisely in the present that all forms of objectivity can be revealed, 
quite concretely as processes. Since it is the present which shows most clearly the unity of result and starting point of the process. Given that the rejection of all oughts in futuristic utopian thinking, the concentration of philosophy on knowledge of the present, grasped dialectically, emerges precisely as the only possible epistemological method of knowing what is really knowable about the future, the tendencies within the present which impel it really really and concretely toward the future. This sounds more like Marx than Hegel, indeed more like the mature Marx than the author of the manuscripts. That work may be seen as transitional between an ethical and a socio-economic approach to knowledge of the future. In the manuscripts, Marx attempts to reconstruct the ideal concepts of political philosophy as potentialities awaiting realization. The contradictions between philosophy and reality are reformulated as imminent contradictions in reality itself. The new method is neither speculative nor empirical, but synthesizes these contrary approaches in a meta-critique. This meta-critique relativizes what is and what ought to be as contradictory tendencies actually inhabiting the real in process. It is through this conception that Marx relativizes ethical ideals as moments in the real process of becoming of what is, and so goes beyond utopian moralism. For example, Marx does not set out from a philosophically elaborated concept of the state contrasted with the existing institutions he wishes to criticize. In fact, he dismisses this method contemptuously in a letter to Rouge. Until now, the philosophers had the solution to all riddles in their desks, and the stupid outside world simply had to open its mouth so that the roasted pigeons of absolute science might fly into it. Instead, the philosophical deduction of what ought to be must proceed from actual struggles testifying to the living contradiction of ideal and real. The appropriate role for the new philosopher consists in explaining to the world its own acts, showing that actual struggles contain a transcending content that can be linked to the concept of a rational social life. The critic, Marx writes, therefore can start with any form of theoretical and practical consciousness and develop the true actuality out of the forms inherent in existing actuality as it's ought to be and goal. In these earliest Marxist writings, Marx can be seen struggling to release new grounds for revolution from Hegelian political philosophy. A generation later, Engels summarized Marx's conclusion with admirable simplicity. Where Hegel had claimed that all that is real is rational, and all that is rational is real, for Marx, the Hegelian proposition turns into its opposite through Hegelian dialectics itself. All that is real in the sphere of human history becomes irrational in the process of time, is therefore irrational by its very destination, is tainted beforehand with irrationality, and everything which is rational in the minds of men is destined to become real, however much it may contradict existing apparent reality. In accordance with all the rules of the Hegelian method of thought, the proposition of the rationality of everything which is real resolves itself into the other proposition. All that exists deserves to perish. In sum, the only way beyond Hegel is through him. Marx makes this passage in the manuscripts where he is finally able to develop the true actuality out of the forms inherent in existing actuality as it's ought to be in goal. There, Marx identifies reason, true actuality, with the socially mediated process of satisfying human needs and on that basis developing human individuality. Then the existing actuality, alienated capitalist society is shown to be reason's unreasonable form, which must be further mediated and overcome through revolution. The critique of political economy, which begins already in the manuscripts, derives socialist potentialities from the contradictions of the given capitalist forms. The ought to be and goal emerges from the dialectic of existence and essence as a demand of reason, a methodological precondition of rationality, and not as an ethical ideal.
As a philosopher of praxis, Marx attempts to reconstruct the concept of reason so that capitalist alienation appears as reason's essential problem, a problem to be resolved through historical action. Marx takes what for Hegel in earlier philosophy is a mere social contingency, human suffering, and it dignifies it with ontological status, not in order to attribute it to the human condition, but rather the better to comprehend the presuppositions of its historical transcendence. These presuppositions are, pre are preserved ideally in philosophy in the concept of reason, and therefore Marx insists against the reformers of the practical political party that you cannot abolish philosophy without realizing it. The concept of an Aufbung of philosophy also has a methodological side with which we will be focally concerned in this book. Once again, it is by reference to the Frankfurt School that I will attempt to clarify the project of the early Marx and Lucas. Metacritique. The term metacritique became widely known through Habermas's use of it to refer to the study of the various forms of theory in the light of their intrinsic dependence on specific knowledge constitutive interests. Habermas distinguishes these interests from those of everyday practical affairs by their enormous generality. However, despite this, they belong to the social world. They are quasi-transcendental conditions of objectivity for the spheres of knowledge they determine. The odd description, quasi-transcendental, refers to their character as neither ordinary social facts nor world-constituting posits of the pure ego. Habermas needs some such concept since he wants to avoid both positivism and historicism in order to affirm both the cognitive value of natural science and its rootedness in a generic interest in technical control that determines the type of object it studies. The term metacritique in this sense bears a certain resemblance to the method of Lucas and Marx insofar as it crosses the usual boundaries between philosophical and social explanation. There is, however, a considerable difference between the metacritical approach in philosophy of praxis and Habermas's metacritique. His knowledge constitutive interests are anthropological in their generality. The relative truth of knowledge is conserved in contact with these interests by reason of their very generality. Reductionism is thus avoided at the cost of a loss in sociological concreteness. Marx and Lucas offer no such theory of general anthropo anthropological interests. Instead, their metacritique moves in the opposite direction toward a domain of concreteness that they claim founds theoretical abstractions. We might better compare this approach with Whitehead's I hold that philosophy is the critic of abstractions. Its function is the double one, first of harmonizing them by assigning to them their relative status as abstractions, and secondly of completing them by direct comparison with more concrete intuitions of the universe and thereby promoting the formation of more complete schemes of thought. In Marx and Lucas, of course, the aim of such criticism of abstractions is not to found a speculative metaphysics, but rather to achieve what might be called a sociological desublimation of the concepts of philosophy. To some extent, this difference in orientation as compared with Habermas may be due to the fact that the latter is primarily concerned to refute a supposedly value-free positivistic empiricism. Concepts drawn from the Kantian tradition are helpful for this purpose. In Kantian philosophy, the formal properties of rationality are abstracted as completely as possible from the particular contents on which the faculty of reason exercises itself. Kant demonstrates that these formal properties as they relate to epistemology ethics and aesthetics are a priori preconditions for any and all knowledge and action in the corresponding domains of real life. Each precondition responds to a distinctive value that is defining for its orientation toward reality. By contrast, Marx and Lucas react against a Kantian cultural climate, 
They follow in the footsteps of Hegel in attempting to resolve the antinomies of form and content that arise from Kant's formalistic paradigm of rationality. To Hegel, they owe dialectics as the method through which the opposites can be reconciled in a higher unity, a totality. The application of the category of totality to the study of historical given forms of rationality provides the basis for a non-reductive social theory of knowledge. Philosophy is not regarded as a mere rationalization of covert interests, nor as a passive reflection of production relations. Rather, it is the form in which the actual contradictions of social life are raised to consciousness under the horizon of the given society. The juxtaposition of the philosophical concepts with a specific social background both explains the impasses and antinomies of theory and shows a path to resolution through social action. Susan Buck Morse argues that Adorno's cultural criticism was deeply influenced by this method as he discovered it in Lucas. She summarizes Lucas's approach as follows. Instead of reducing bourgeois thought to the economic conditions of its production, Lucas argued that the nature of those conditions could be found within the intellectual phenomena themselves. Once these thinkers accepted given social reality as the reality, they had to come upon a barrier of rationality which could not be overcome and which had led Kant to posit the thing in itself, because that barrier could not be removed from theory without being removed from society. Conversely, if theorists could see through the reified appearances, they would recognize the, that the antinomies of philosophy were due not to the inadequacies of reason, but to those of the reality in which reason tried to find itself. Much the same analysis could be made of Marx's early critique of political philosophy. Buck Morse contrasts sociological reductionism and metacritique. But, but what does it mean to find the nature of economic conditions within the intellectual phenomena? This is a crucial point that requires clarification in the case of Marx by reference to the influence of Feuerbach. Feuerbach's central idea is that philosophy is secularized theology. He says, what lies in the other world for religion lies in this world for philosophy. When philosophy identifies the subject with reason, with thinking, it brings the theological idea of spirit down to earth. Similarly, the concept of the object as an object of thought, constituted by thought or obeying rational laws, is a homely transcendental equivalent or equivalent of biblical genesis. This appears to be a crass reduction of the essence of philosophy. What makes Feuerbach interesting is his attempt to go beyond this basic thesis toward a reconstruction of philosophy. Feuerbach calls Hegel's thought, which he sees as the culmination of the philosophical tradition, a philosophy of identity. The identity referred to is that of thought in being, reason, and reality. This identity is theological, and to it Feuerbach opposes what he calls the true and absolute viewpoint. The viewpoint of the distinction between I and thou, subject and object. Yet although Feuerbach rejects the philosophy of identity, he reconstructs its formal principles on another plane. He detaches the formal structure of philosophy from its concept of the subject and object. The philosophy of the future, as he calls it, will conserve these formal traits but attach them to new subject-object concept. This is a meta-critique of fundamental philosophical concepts. These concepts are relativized by reconstructing them in the concrete existential domains from which they were first abstracted. Farback first redefines the concepts of subject and object arguing that they are both sensuous, natural things in the world, which cannot be brought together merely conceptually. The identity achieved in and through thought is spurious and ideological, but there is another kind of subject-object identity, which can be achieved through sense perception and love. Farbach writes, the identity of subject and object, which in self-consciousness, in other words, in Hegel, is only an abstract idea is truth and reality only in man's sensuous perception of man. Thus the formal principle, 
subject-object identity is taken from Hegel and conserved while its content in Hegel's thought is rejected. The upshot is an enlargement of the concept of the subject to include more than thinking, to include the whole human being, so to speak. This enlarged subject retains what might be called an ontological pathos through its continued submission to the formal principles of idealism. Feuerbach expressed his conclusion in ringing phrases that certainly influenced Marx. <clears throat> Farbach says, or I think Farbach, yeah. The unity of thought and being has meaning and truth only when man is comprehended as the ground and subject of this unity. Only a real being recognizes real objects. Only where thought is not the subject of itself, but a predicate of a real being is the idea not separated from being. From this result, the following categorical imperatives. Desire not to be a philosopher as distinct from a man. Be nothing else than a thinking man. Do not think as a thinker, that is, with a faculty torn from the totality of the real human being and isolated for itself. Think as a living and real being, as one exposed to the vivifying and refreshing waves of the world's oceans. Think in existence, in the world as a member of it, not in the vacuum of abstraction, as a solitary monad, as an absolute monarch, as an indifferent superworldly god, then you can be sure that your ideas are unities of being and thought." End quote. That is precisely Marx's starting point in the manuscripts. Or, sorry, I guess it wasn't a Feuerbach quote, I guess it was a Marx quote. <clears throat> there he attempts to obey Feuerbach's injunction by heroic efforts to overcome the gap between thought and life. As Marx puts it, one basis for life and another for science is a priori a falsehood. Elsewhere in the text, Marx expresses himself in the first person in a manner that indicates his personal stake in the matter. My universal consciousness is only the theoretical form of that whose living form is the real community, the social entity, although at the present day this universal consciousness is an abstraction from real life and is opposed to it as an enemy. That is why the activity of my universal consciousness as such is my theoretical existence as a social being. However, Marx is a better dialectician and more rigorous thinker than Feuerbach. He is not content to retain simply the general form of the philosophy of identity while giving, while giving an anthropolo anthropological twist to the concepts of subject and object. He takes more than this form from Hegel in order to accomplish more ambitious goals than Feuerbach's. Marx follows Hegel in requiring that subject-object unity be grasped as the actual constitution of the object by the subject. And like Hegel, he tries to avoid a fictian reduction of the object to the subject through a dialectical conception of their relationship. He also agrees with the Hegel of the phenomenolo phenomenology of spirit that this relationship is established in the historical process. He accepts, in other words, what Lucas describes as Hegel's program to see the absolute, the goal of his philosophy, as a result remains valid for Marxism with its very different objects of knowledge, and is even of greater concern to it as the dialectical process is seen to be identical with the course of history. The formal principles Marx retains are thus richer and more complex than those that survive Feuerbach's critical appropriation of traditional philosophy. As Marx works out his program in the manuscripts, it becomes clear that he is attempting not just to reform a philosophy, Feuerbach's phrase, but a rigorous aufbung off or transcendence of Hegelian idealism and with it a philosophy generally. To accomplish this, Marx develops a meta-critique of Hegel, designed to show that the concept of reason as absolute knowledge is still a theological attempt to overcome social alienation and thought. The, the ordre de raison must be reversed. When alienation is overcome in real life, then and only then will it be possible to overcome the alienation of reason. Thus, the manuscripts do not achieve their end in a mere philosophical reformulation of the concept of reason. 
Revolution becomes the basis for a new constellation, overcoming the opposition of thought in life, thinker and society, by founding reason practically in life and community. The retention of the formal structure of Hegel's thought infused with this new content yields a philosophy of praxis. The Realization of Philosophy What makes the approach taken by Marx and Lucas unique and distinguishes it not only from Kant but also from Hegel is their belief that the primary antinomy to be overcome is that of traditional philosophy and social reality. Here the term metacritic applies in a double sense. Not only do Marx and Lucas attempt to relate philosophical abstractions to the social life world, they also claim to identify the intrinsic limitation of the traditional philosophical method of abstraction. Because traditional philosophy assumes that the alienated foundations of the social order are rooted in the very nature of reality, it concludes that the antinomies can only be resolved speculatively in thought and formulates them in view of such a resolution. The criterion of philosophical adequacy that guides concept formation in the tradition thus reflects an implicit sense of the limits of social change that Marx and Lucas challenge. They argue that the resolution of the antinomies requires a radical social transformation unimagined by their predecessors. Nevertheless, neither Marx nor Lucas simply dismiss philosophy. Rather, they proceed from the assumption that the tension between the concept of reason and its concrete social substratum reflects contradictions in social reality. Despite its limits, traditional philosophy was able to identify social potentialities, even if only in a speculative form. The problem now consists in re reconstructing the insights of philosophy in a new context, oriented toward practical social change. Marcuse summarizes this conclusion as follows. The philosophical construction of reason is replaced by the creation of a rational society. The philosophical ideals of a better world and of true being are incorporated into the practical aim of struggling mankind, where they take on a human form. In sum, the metacritical approach, as the term will be used here, it consists in dialectically relativizing philosophical form and social content and correspondingly theory and practice. Marx and Lucas do not philo philosophize within the historically given tradition, presupposing the continuing validity of philosophy as such. An eo ipso of its forms of evidence and its problematics. Rather, they consider the tradition as essentially completed and then proceed to study it from outside as a moment in a larger social process in which action can intervene. It is in this light and not in some merely pragmatic sense of urgency that we are to understand Marx's 11th thesis on Feuerbach. Philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. Within the tradition of Western Marxism, these rather opaque formulations of the theory practice relation have a quite definite meaning. One of the aims of this book is to clarify that meaning. Since I am writing within that tradition myself, I will follow Marx's and Lucas's co construction of terms like philosophy, theory, practice, and phrases like the unity of theory and practice, the realization of philosophy. Before proceeding on this basis, I would like to step briefly outside that framework to anticipate some objections. I will put these objections in the form of questions that implicitly challenge the very idea of a unity of theory and practice or a realization of philosophy. One, Marx and Lucas claim that they are realizing philosophy, putting theory into practice. How does this differ from applying theory to the solution of a practical problem? Two, Marx and Lucas claim that the ph philosophical tradition is finished which would seem to mean that they themselves are not philosophers contributing to that tradition. Yet surely the economic and philosophical manuscripts and history and class consciousness are philosophical works. Are they then philosophers after all? And if so, how can they elaborate a philosophy on the basis of the proposition that philosophy is dead? Three, Marx and Lucas seem to say that only the revolution can solve philosophical problems 
and yet they proposed solutions to these problems before the revolution. Does this not imply that the revolution is, after all, irrelevant to the solutions of philosophical problems? These questions arise from ambiguities in Western Marxism's special terminology. When this terminology is understood, it becomes clear that Marx and Lucas are not making quite such radical claims as at first appears. The chief difficulty stems from ambiguities in the terms philosophy and theory. I will therefore begin with this issue. In its usual meaning, philosophy refers to the activity of reflecting on the basic assumptions and concepts of a discipline, practice, or culture. In this sense, Marx and Lucas are obviously still doing philosophy, and they would not deny it. But for them, philosophy refers to a specific historical tradition that, that develops common themes from the Greeks to Hegel. They regard this tradition as completed, and they would deny that they are merely continuing it in their own work. The unity of the tradition consists in certain paradigmatic concepts and methods that run through it from beginning to end, in spite of variations and innovations. It is this paradigm that has been exhausted, not the activity of reflection per se. The early Marx and Lucas, Nietzsche, Heidegger, and Derrida have all proposed general theories of the unity of the philosophical tradition, and on that basis have announced its end. Reflection continues, and, in, and indeed, it has no original, original concepts to substitute for the old ones. But the philosopher's relation to these concepts is no longer immediate, naive. The death of philosophy means no more than that thinkers become conscious of the historical limits of the cultural system on the basis of which these concepts arise. For Marxists, this consciousness is specifically social. They trace the origin of philosophy's eternal truths, its constants and paradigms back to a social world that is in the process of disappearing. There is a particularly clear statement of this position in the Communist Manifesto. The history of all past society has consisted in the development of class antagonisms, antagonisms that assumed different forms at different epochs. But whatever form they may have taken, one fact is common to all past ages, the exploitation of one part of society by the other. No wonder then that the social consciousness of past ages, despite all the multiplicity and variety it displays, moves within certain forms or general ideas, which cannot completely vanish except with the total disappearance of class antagonisms. The communist revolution is the most radical rupture with traditional property relations. No wonder that its development involves the most radical rupture with traditional ideas. If we accept the limitation of philosophy to a specific tradition bound up with the history of class society, then we need a wider term with which to refer to the general process of reflection on basic assumptions of which philosophy would be an instance. This more general term is theory. Now we need to distinguish between two types of theory, a type that is identified with traditional philosophy and a new type in which Marxism engages. This is precisely the distinction between traditional and critical theory that Horkheimer introduced in a famous essay. Like the Frankfurt School, Marx and Lucas argue that traditional theory has been superseded by a new critical theory. They do not suggest that philosophy should be abandoned for practical activity or simply applied in the usual sense of the term. The point then is not that reflection should cease, but that a new kind of reflection is needed. This new reflection differs from the old in treating many assumptions the philosophical tradition took for granted as relative to the social situation from which they arise. Come here. For example, instead of accepting the eternal necessity of the antinomy of public and private interest, critical theory shows that this antinomy belongs to a specific social world. Critical theory still works with the concepts of public and private interest elaborated in philosophy, but it problematizes the social background against which these two forms of interest appear as antinomial opposites. The critique of abstract or pure theory is to be understood in this context. 
Once again, it is not that Marx and Lucas reject the re, reject conceptual generality for empirical specificity, but rather that the process of abstraction in which philosophy detaches its concepts from their social basis gives rise to a bias they reject. Philosophy treats its concepts as though they rested on eternal facts of nature or the human condition. But once conceived in this way, the social background of these concepts is occluded and it becomes impossible to imagine a role for human action in resolving the philosophical problems they entail. Marx and Lucas thus do not return to empirical so much as show the inseparable connection between the most abstract concepts of philosophy and a concrete social context that can be changed. Let me return now to the example of the antinomy of public and private interest to illustrate how practice can contribute to resolving a theoretical problem. Plato sets up the problem as philosophy has treated it ever since. The lower classes of the Republic pursue private interests and this disqualifies them from rule. Plato's guardians are qualified to rule by the complete elimination of their private lives. They cannot even know their own children. For the Greeks, the abolition of the family is the abolition of the private sphere, hence also private interest. The antinomy is evident here. It does not disappear in as different a philosopher as Rousseau. He distinguishes the general will from the will of all as public versus private interest. He does not conceive of a special class as the bearer of the general will, but instead projects the antinomy onto the individual. The division in the soul this produces requires virtue in the citizen to resist mere greed. Even Mandeville, who claims that private vices are public benefits, readily admits that the intention of the individuals in pursuing private interests has nothing to do with the public benefits achieved by a paradoxical reversal. The antinomy survives down to the present. The original position, famous from Rawls's A Theory of Justice, accomplishes the same division of public from private interests that Plato demands. Habermas, with his rigid distinction between communicative and strategic uses of language, also perpetuates the antinomy. For a Marxist, the limitation of this type of thinking is clear. The unquestioned assumption that lies behind the antinomy is the permanency of privately owned means of production and the resulting antagonism between the members of society. Public interests then arise alongside private ones insofar as the community has needs that are not identical with the mere summation of these antagonistic private interests. But what if historical conditions arose in which private ownership of means of production could be replaced by the rational administration of both the economy and the state in the interests of the whole community? Of course, some forms of personal private interests would remain, but these would not stand in an antagonistic relation to the public interest of the community. Instead of dedication to public interest requiring a virtuous dictatorship of general renunciation of private interests, the two would be in harmony, the free development of each supporting the free development of all. The traditional philosophical construction of the issue would no longer apply, or at least so claims Marxist theory. The point I want to make is not that such a Marxist reform of society would work, that is another problem, but rather that once one envisages it as a real possibility, social action appears to play a central role in resolving a philosophical problem that has traditionally been treated as purely theoretical in character. It is this new role for social action that is intended by the concept of a realization of philosophy. Philosophy is realized in the sense that its old ideal of somehow reconciling public and private interest is finally achieved. This realization involves a radical social change and not a purely conceptual mediation such as Plato's utopia, Rousseau's virtue, or Mandeville's version of the invisible hand. Note that this new type of theoretical reflection need not await the revolution. Reflection can always go beyond the given achievements of its era toward ideal outcomes. This is true of Marx as much as it is of Plato, but what appears as a real possibility to anticipatory thinking differs drastically with time and place. 
Although Plato could imagine women becoming guardians in his ideal republic, he saw no way to abolish slavery. Aristotle once made the fantastic suggestion that slavery could be abolished if tools could activate themselves without human agency. Marx writes in a time when this idle fantasy of the ancients appears as an imminent possibility. On the basis of this changed historical situation, he imagines a wholly different practical context for, for philosophy than the one prevailing in all previous class societies. Thus, Marxists can propose theoretical solutions to problems the revolution is supposed to solve practically. However, they do generally insist that only by struggling against capitalism has the working class been able to problematize the dominant assumptions of a millennial class culture so that new solutions to old problems can be anticipated. Later chapters will explain this connection between theory and practice in more detail.